this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the funding of the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is well known across the state. Jim Potter is the senior historian in the Research and Publications Division of the Nebraska State Historical Society. Jim's topic is the greatest gathering of Indians ever assembled, the 1875 Black Hills Council at Red Cloud Agency, Nebraska. Please welcome Jim Potter. Thank you, John, for that nice introduction. I don't know if I'm as well known as he said, but I, I try to do what I need to do and otherwise keep a low profile. The title of the talk that you see up there, the quoted portion of it, is actually from a newspaper account from a newspaper man who attended this council, so I can't be honestly sure if this was the greatest gathering of Indians ever assembled, but it was certainly a very large one. And it was a very important uh, uh, gathering, and so that forms the, the basis of my talk today is the, the story of the 1875 Black Hills Council, which took place at Red Cloud Agency, Nebraska. Now, the story of relations between the U.S. government and the people who already lived here on the continent when the Europeans came is fascinating, complex, and often tragic. In the 19th century, Nebraska actually played host to two of the most significant formal councils between representatives of the government and Indians. These negotiations were noteworthy because of the issues involved, their effect upon the future of Indian-white relations, and because they were two of the largest such gatherings in American history. One of the Nebraska councils is at least modestly well known <coughs> And the other one, which is the one I'm talking about today, is, is generally relatively obscure. And this council is less well known perhaps because it was soon overshadowed by more dramatic events that actually resulted from, from the negotiations. The first of the two Nebraska councils was the great gathering at Horse Creek, Nebraska, which is just barely east of the modern day Nebraska-Wyoming border that was held in September of 1851. This council was originally planned to be held at Fort Laramie, and the Indians all assembled at Fort Laramie waiting for the government commissioners to arrive from, I think they left from St. Louis. And by the time the commissioners uh, got there, or before they got there, the Indian ponies had eaten all the grass within miles of Fort Laramie. So they decided to move the gathering downstream uh, just across, of course, there was no Nebraska-Wyoming border in those days, but they moved it to where, the, where Horse Creek flows into the North Platte River. There, the, the Grand Council of 1851 was held. It included both plains and mountain tribes, including the Lakotas or Western Sioux, the Crows, the Shoshones, and the Cheyennes, and it occupied about 18 days. Some estimates place the number of Indians there from eight to 10,000. The resulting agreement or treaty that was concluded there is officially known as the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851, but is popularly, popularly called the Horse Creek Treaty because of the location where the negotiations took place. In return for government compensation in the form of, of rations and presents, the Indians in 1851 agreed to accept tribal boundaries to keep the peace to allow the government to build forts in their country and not to molest the immigrants along the Oregon-California trails. However, it would not be long before conflict did come. Just a few years later, in 1854, was the so-called Grattan fight near Fort Laramie, which occurred when a rice young lieutenant and 29 soldiers were wiped out in an ill-conceived attempt to arrest an Indian who had butchered a stray immigrant cow. This episode, in turn, led to the Army's retaliatory attack 
The following year, in 1855, on a brulee Sioux village near Ash Hollow, Nebraska, which is interpreted at the visitor center at, at Ash Hollow State Historic Park. This is also sometimes known as the Battle of Blue Water Creek because that was the name of the creek where it actually took place. In 1864 and 65, there was serious fighting along the Platte Valley, and in 1865, the Army mounted a campaign into the Powder River country as a retaliation to those Platte Valley attacks. Right on its heels came what's been known as Red Cloud's War on the Bozeman Trail. Gold had been discovered in Montana. Uh, a trail had been opened up from the Platte Valley up to the Montana gold fields, and the Army established forts along the east side of the Bighorn Mountains. Well, that was Indian country, and they didn't like it one bit. So uh, they, uh, Red Cloud and, and other, other leaders organized attacks on these Army forts. And in December of 1866, uh, the Indians wiped out Captain William Fetterman and 80 soldiers at, uh, at a site not far from Fort Phil Kearney. This Indian victory actually brought the U.S. government back to the bargaining table, which then in turn led to the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. That treaty was actually conducted, the negotiations were conducted at Fort Laramie, as the name implies. The 1868 treaty, which is, is arguably one of the more important ones uh, in, in the 19th century, granted the Lakotas a permanent reservation in Dakota Territory north of Nebraska and west of the Missouri River. It also provided the basis for the future relationship between the Lakotas and the U.S. government. In return for giving up some land and accepting a reservation from which whites would be excluded, the government would provide the Lakotas with rations for four years and educational and agricultural assistance for longer periods to help them adapt to the inevitable end of their hunting lifestyle. Eventually, it was hoped they would become self-supporting, or the, the government euphemism for that was civilized people. They would no longer roam uh, the land and live off of hunting. The Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 anticipated the prospect of future sessions of Indian land if three-quarters of the adult males of the bands who had signed the treaty would agree to do so. And this was, of course, one of the clauses in the treaty that provided how future Indian land should be acquired. There were a significant number of the Lakotas, mainly those led by Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, who were living in the Powder River and Yellowstone River countries where game remained relatively abundant, who did not join in making the 1868 treaty. These northern bands and their leaders had never agreed to accept a reservation or any restrictions upon their right to roam and hunt where they pleased. This is an important factor in understanding the second council and the one I'm going to talk principally about that was held in Nebraska, which took place near Red Cloud Agency in late summer of 1875. For those of you who may not know, Red Cloud Agency was the Indian agency just about a mile and a half east of the present day site of, of Fort Robinson and actually the agency site is within Fort Robinson State Park. You can visit it today if you go up there. Here's a picture of Red, Red Cloud Agency about the same time as the council I'm talking about. Those of you who've been up in that part of Nebraska will easily recognize the buttes in the background which look the same today with perhaps a slight change in vegetation. The agency, as I said, was uh, about a mile and a half east of what was then called Camp Robinson, the military post. And this was the place where the government distributed the rations and other supplies that they had promised the Lakotas under the Treaty of 1868. Now, there were several developments that led to this 1875 council. The first and probably the most important one was when Lieutenant General George Custer led the 7th Cavalry into the Black Hills in the summer of 1874 and, and found gold there. This, of course, the Black Hills was, was part of the Sioux Reservation that had been set aside in 1868, so it was off limits to white people. So the expedition itself was a violation of the treaty, and then the subsequent rush of hundreds of miners into the Black Hills was an additional and, and gross trespass on Indian lands. However, the Black Hills was a very attractive uh, parcel once, uh, once it was determined that it had potential gold resources because the nation was even then barely recovering from the financial panic of 1873. 
So the notion of a new bonanza in gold was certainly attractive. The government, in fact, in, uh, faced significant pressure from all walks of, of government, uh, journalism, and so on to open up the Black Hills to mining and settlement. And the government was obligated by the Treaty of 1868 to, to keep the miners out or if they were in there to get them out. So they made some half-hearted efforts to, to force the miners to leave the Black Hills, but Black Hills being a large area, the army being very small, uh, it ultimately, be, ultimately became clear that it was going to be very difficult to keep people out of the Black Hills with, with military, uh, military force. So the government decided the best solution was let's try to buy the Black Hills from the, from the Lakotas. After all, there's a provision in the 1868 treaty that provides for a mechanism to do so. In fact, many people living in the West thought that one reason that some of the prominent Lakota leaders, such as Red Cloud of the Oglala, Spotted Tail of the Brulees, were taken to Washington, D.C. in May of 1875 was to actually talk about giving up the Black Hills, but of course that really wasn't the way the, the, the Indians saw it, and they didn't want to talk about, about the Black Hills uh, in Washington. Incidentally, this is a photograph which probably wasn't taken at exactly that same time, but here you have Red Cloud, who's the, the, the leader of the Oglala Band. Here's Spotted Tail, well-known uh, head of the Brulees. Uh, I think they've made some errors on this identification. This is uh, Swift Bear, who was also a Brulee. This is Sitting Bull, but not the, the, the more famous Sitting Bull that we've, we've heard about in terms of the Little Bighorn Battle and so on. This is an Oglala by the name of Sitting Bull. He's often called Sitting Bull of the South or Sitting Bull of the Oglala, but he was an important head man in, in Red Cloud's band. This photo was taken in Omaha at some time when these Indians went through on their way probably to visit the Great Father in Washington. And Julius Meyer here, he ran an Indian store in Omaha, and so he got himself photographed every time when these chiefs came through and sold curios and things. So um, I don't know exactly when this photo was taken, but probably mid 1870s certainly. Now, as I said, the, the chiefs, Red Cloud and Spotted Tail, were, were in Washington and, and, and others in uh, the spring of 1875, but they didn't want to talk about the Black Hills then. They said, if you want to talk about the Black Hills, send people out to our country and we'll sit down in our country and talk about the Black Hills. So accordingly, in June of 1875, President Grant approved the appointment of a commission whose charge was, quote, to treat with the Sioux Indians for the relinquishment of the Black Hills. Now, the first step in this relatively drawn-out process was to send several of these government commissioners out in July and August of that same year to hold preliminary meetings with the, the Indians here at the Nebraska agencies and also to go up to the, the, the agencies that were located along the Missouri River and set the groundwork for this Grand Council. This is an interesting photograph because after these these several commissioners, uh, the subcommission, I'll call them, got to Red Cloud Agency and Spotted Tail Agency in uh, July and August of 1875. They then took some of those Indians with them. They actually went right up across the Black Hills through the mining camps to meet with the Missouri River Agency Indians. And this photograph is of a, a few Indians from this delegation from Red Cloud and Spotted Tail that were actually photographed in the Black Hills in the summer of 1875. Uh, these three, I don't know exactly who they are because it's hard to tell from this photograph. And these two gentlemen are the, the interpreters that went with them. So you can imagine what the Indians thought. They got to the Black Hills on their way up to the Missouri River, and here were these thousands of miners already digging holes in the ground on their land. Up on the Missouri, you had smaller bands of Lakotas, the Yanktonay, Minikanju, Unkpapa, Two Kettle, Blackfeet and Sanzarks. These were all sub sub bands of the, the Lakota Nation. And uh, the commissioners then visited them too and said, we're going to hold this big council in September down at Red Cloud or near Red Cloud and Spotted Tail Agencies. And they arranged for these Indians to come down to Nebraska from the Missouri River. The commissioners said, we'll probably hold the council on Shadron Creek, which is a, a creek just west of the modern-day town of Shadron, about halfway between these, these two Nebraska agencies. They also sent some Indians from the Nebraska agencies 
north to the Powder River country to talk to the Indians under Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull to see if they would be willing to come to the council as well. Well, most of them weren't and didn't want anything to do with it, but a few of the so-called wild Indians did actually come down for the Grand Council, which was ultimately set to open in September of 1875. This map, by the way, I should have put it up just slightly earlier, gives you a, a, a good feel for the, the geography. This is the Great Sioux Reservation. It went farther north, of course, and pretty much everything west of the Missouri River. There's the Black Hills. These Nebraska agencies for Red Cloud's people and for Spotted Tail's people were not actually on the Great Sioux Reservation. There are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they didn't want to move to the reservation. They liked they liked where they had been, which was down near Fort Laramie, and they hunted down in this area a lot. So the government worked hard to get them into the Sioux Reservation, but they finally got them to move this far north. The other reason they weren't on the reservation is this boundary line between Dakota and Nebraska had not yet been surveyed. So there was some thought, well, maybe they are on the reservation, but no, they, they weren't. They were in Nebraska. But Anyway, these agencies were, were established in 1873 and 74 up there, and that's where the bulk of the, the agency Lakotas were living at the time of this council. Back to the commission. There were a number of leading men placed with this charge of negotiating the sale of the Black Hills. The chairman of the commission was a U.S. senator from Iowa named William B. Allison, shown here. The other members included this man, uh, Reverend Samuel Hinman, who was an Episcopal missionary to the Santee uh, Sioux and had frequently in, uh, interpreted for treaty councils and treaty negotiations because he was conversant in the language. Uh, one of the councilmen was Army Officer General Alfred Terry. There was a former Missouri congressman named Abraham Comingo, a lawyer from Beatrice, Nebraska named W.H. Ashby, and then this man who was a, a, a French-Canadian fur trader, or by descent a French-Canadian, G.P. Beauvais, who had entered the fur trade in the, in the 1830s, had uh, long associated with Indians. He'd, uh, he'd run trading posts out on the, on the, near the forks of the Platte during the, the Overland immigrant period. And then the final commissioner was a man by the name of A.G. Lawrence, who was from Rhode Island. Now, of these commissioners, only this man, Beauvais, General Terry, who had been in the Army for a long time, and uh, Samuel Hinman had very much experience dealing with Indians. Beauvais had actually lived amongst the Indians and fathered some children by Indian women, so he, he spoke the language. He was also very, very knowledgeable about Indian life ways. When these commissioners arrived at the Red Cloud Agency early September, about September 4th of 1875, they found literally thousands of Indians camped around that area in the White River Valley of northwestern Nebraska. Many of them, of course, were the people that had already resided there at the Red Cloud and Spotted Tail agencies. Others were the, the Missouri River tribes who had come down for the Grand Council. We really don't know how many were there. Uh, the newspaper men floated estimates. Uh, I've seen estimates as high as 20,000 total Indians in the area. Of course, that would include their entire families, women and children. Nevertheless, if you can imagine what the area must have looked like with, with uh, hundreds of teepees, thousands of ponies scattered for probably a radius of 25 or 30 miles. It would have been an impressive sight. This is actually a photograph taken near the Red Cloud Agency of Red Dog's Village, and I don't think necessarily it was taken in 1875, but certainly in this same time period. Red Dog was one of the principal headmen of, of Red Cloud's Oglala Band, and I thought this was a fascinating photograph when I finally got a clear look at it because this would be just south of the Red Cloud Agency site that I showed you. But if, you, if you're familiar with northwestern Nebraska, there's Crow Butte, which was then and still is a prominent landmark just east of Crawford, Nebraska. So uh, you can kind of get a frame of reference if you're, if you're familiar with Crow Butte. It's, uh, it's one of the high buttes that stands out from, from the rest in, in a significant way. Actually, once the commission got to Red Cloud Agency, it still took more than two weeks before the council really got underway because the Indians were arguing amongst themselves about where to hold the council. Red Cloud thought 
he should have it right at his agency. Well, Spotted Tail wanted it closer to his agency, so the Indians themselves wrangled about it. The commissioners had told the Indians in the summer when they visited them that they were going to hold it on Shadron Creek, which would be oh, 10 or 15 miles east of Red Cloud Agency or so, but they decided after they got settled in at the agency stockade, they had their quarters there, they didn't want to go that far every day to meet with the Indians, so they finally ended up concluding to have the council about six or seven miles uh, northeast of the Red Cloud Agency, and uh, which would put it not on this picture, but just north of Crow Butte, almost straight north of Crow Butte. Because of the great public interest in the opening or possible opening of the Black Hills, many newspapers sent reporters out to this council, including ones from Omaha, Chicago, and even as far away as New York City. Uh, I've got a picture of a couple of the, whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot, to, let, let me just regress, I, I meant to show you this slide. This is an, a contemporary 1875 map. This is now Crow Butte, it was once called Dancer's Hill because of a, a little Indian battle that took place there, but Camp Robinson and the Red Cloud Agency roughly here. Camp Sheridan and Spotted Tail's agency would be approximately straight north of the modern day town of Hay Springs, Nebraska. There's nothing left of it, it's all disappeared except the landscape. And then this creek right here would be approximately, I think this is Shadron Creek, the modern day town of Shadron sits somewhere in this region. So the, the commissioners had hinted that the in, at the Indians that they would hold the council over here, which would kind of split the difference between Spotted Tail and, and Red Cloud, but in the end they didn't hold it, they held it roughly in this area here. The newspaper men. This is one of them that wrote a lot of dispatches from the Grand Council. He was the reporter for the Omaha Daily Herald named John T. Bell. He, uh, he wrote scores of letters and actually later on, went on later to write a, a fairly well-known early history of Omaha, which you can see over in the library if, you, if we can ever get in there again, Cindy. Another of the reporters was actually an Army officer, uh, Captain Andrew Burt, who was moonlighting for the New York Tribune. That wasn't uncommon in those days for these papers to hire one of these officers that was already out on the ground to, uh, to make a report. So these dispatches are really fascinating because here you have a bunch of white reporters uh, sitting in on these negotiations and they had a lot of time to kill so they wrote a lot of stuff about just what was going on day to day. And of course much of their writing reflects the biases against and the stereotypes of Indians that many Americans shared. However, they couldn't completely escaped the fact that when they wrote about Indians, they, they inevitably said some things that, that made them seem human and, and like other people. And so even though they often called them the uncivilized savages and they were rascals, lazy, shiftless dogs or untutored children of nature, uh, they ended up uh, showing through the, if you read between the lines, that. The Indians were like everybody else. They wanted, uh, they wanted to protect their families. They wanted to live where they wanted to live and so on and so forth. They also demonstrated that the Indians had a great sense of humor. Uh, at least many of the leaders did and some of the reports reflect that and I'll read a couple of examples here shortly. In the end, of course, uh, the chiefs, Red Cloud, Spotted Tail and many of the other leading headmen, they were simply trying to defend their land and their way of life and they knew what the 1868 Fort, Le Fort Laramie Treaty said about land sessions, and they were really just trying to get the government to live up to its obligations, and the government had so far failed to because, of course, of the trespass in the, in the Black Hills. And if they were to give up land, they expected the government to compensate them for it. Now, one of the things that these reporters witnessed while they were at Red Cloud Agency waiting for the council was the beef issue. As I said, the government was providing uh, food subsistence to, to the Indians there according to the terms of the, the treaty and the fact that there was virtually no buffalo left or any other kind of, of significant game to hunt. So the, the reporter for the Omaha Bee wrote a letter that described the issue of beef on the hoof to the Red Cloud Agency Indians and he, he called it, quote, one of the most sickening sights we have ever witnessed. But basically every few days live cattle would be weighed and issued out to, to the, the Indian head people, the, the family leaders, on the basis of so many head for so many people. And what they would do, 
they would assemble at Red Cloud Agency. This is actually a photograph of another beef issue day. I don't know just which one this was, where the, the Indians on horseback would assemble near the agency and wait for the cattle to be turned out. As uh, the, the Omaha Bee correspondent put it, he said about 3,000 mounted Indians surrounded the corral where the cattle were confined. And as soon as they were turned out, squads from, of from 2 to 20 Indians mounted on horses and armed with rifles commenced chasing and shooting at the cattle. Here's a direct quote from his, from his account. We have seen some of those Texan cattle having as many as a dozen rifle balls emptied into their quivering bodies before they fell. Sometimes a steer before falling would run at the top of its speed a distance of two or three and even five miles, all the time receiving a steady fire from the savages that were following them up. To us it seemed like reviving all the excitement of the buffalo chase. Well, indeed it was about the best they could do uh, to recapture the the buffalo hunting style. Now as these reporters sat around, they also uh, uh, tried to interview Indians and they, they kind of uh, looked around to see what else was interesting to report because they still didn't have anything to report on the negotiations. And the Indians were sly creatures in terms of knowing how to kind of take advantage of these reporters. Uh, one of the other reporters told what happened to the New York Herald reporter from the big city when he tried to interview Spotted Tail and Red Cloud. Quote, Spotted Tail finally consented to the affliction on condition that the reporter would first pay him $10 and an interpreter 5 Then the correspondent prepared himself for a good square talk, but had received answers to only a few preliminary questions when Old Spot arose and quietly walked away with, with the remark, There, young man, I guess you've got about $15 worth. And that was the end of that interview. Now, the same reporter tried to interview Red Cloud, and Red Cloud said, nah, I'm, I'm really not in the habit of talking to just one man. I like to talk to a big crowd of people. Here's what the reporter uh, wrote. But, explained the New York scribe, what you say to me will be told to thousands and thousands of people. Yes, replied Red Cloud, and what you write is like me rolling up a cigarette. I give one puff, there is a cloud of smoke, and that is the end of it. Well, after settling the site of the council north of Crow Butte, they actually held a session, the first session, on September 20th. Uh, the commissioners left the Red Cloud Agency, and they had a small escort of soldiers from Camp Robinson, which is shown here in 1875. And when they got to the council grounds, they found several thousand uh, Indians, mostly chiefs, headmen, and warriors, assembled around a, a lone cottonwood tree where... The, the soldiers had, uh, or somebody had erected a, a canvas awning to shade probably the commissioners, not, not the Indians. And what, what they heard primarily was Allison make a speech about which he first said, the government wants only to lease the Black Hills from you. And when, when he said that, of course, uh, the, many of the, the Indians erupted in hearty laughter. They knew, they knew how ridiculous that sounded. Here's a couple of them that would have been present there. Red Dog here. And uh, Yellow Robe, these are two of the Oglalas that, that were at the council. Allison went on to say once they dug, the, the government or the miners had dug all the gold out of the Black Hills, they, they would give them back to the, to the Indians and they could do what they wanted with them. As one of the correspondents wrote, quote, the Indians evidently thought that the, once the white man gets fairly located in the section referred to, it, it would be a very difficult matter to get him out. This is one of my favorites. Spotted Tail is widely known as, as a very astute and, uh, and have a wry sense of humor. He, there are many other stories about some of the jokes Spotted Tail pulled or told, and this is one that I particularly like. Spotted Tail recognize the absurdity of leasing the Black Hills, digging the gold, and giving them back to the Indians. According to Mr. Bell of the Omaha Herald, Spotted Tail uh, said this, or this is Bell's words, rather, quote, as we were driving back to the agency after the talk, the four-horse ambulance conveying the newspaper man overtook a light spring wagon in which Spotted Tail was seated, whereupon the latter called out, I would like to get your mules to haul wood this winter and return them in the spring. Thus making a sly drive at the proposition he had just listened to relative to the Black Hills country, and which joke was fully appreciated by the occupants of the ambulance. 
The reporters also went on to describe the most dramatic of the several sessions which took place on September 23rd in which this gentleman, Little Big Man, who was a northern Indian from Crazy Horses Group and other warriors who had come down from the north threw the council into a turmoil. When everybody sat down to start talking, Little Big Man and, and quite a few warriors who were all painted up and, and heavily armed kind of surrounded the council circle and threatened to shoot the first Indian who would advocate selling the Black Hills. Of course, the commissioners were sort of sitting there quaking in their boots. Finally, one of the friendly chiefs, a uh, uh, young man afraid of his horses from Red Cloud's agency, organized some of his policemen, and they, they dispersed the, the wild Indians and got them out of there, and, and no shots were fired. However, had that happened, it's very unlikely that any of the commissioners for sure would have survived, and it would have been a case of, of the Indians fighting amongst themselves as well. This made it pretty clear that there wasn't going to be much chance of, of a successful outcome to the council. This is a headline from one of the, uh, I think the Omaha, the Omaha Bee, that talks about the narrow escape from a bloody massacre, so on and so forth. Well, the commissioner sat down with some of the leading men of the various bands several more times before the very final session on September 29th. In addition to leasing, the commissioners had been authorized to offer $6 million to purchase the Black Hills outright. Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and other leaders held out for $7 million, or even higher in some cases, as well as a guarantee that the government would feed and clothe them for seven generations. Now, some of the agency Indians, as well as the followers of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, Little Big Man, as an example, opposed giving up the hills under any circumstances, but there were quite a number that were willing to do so if the price was right. Well, the, the reporters there and the editors back home credited the failure of the, uh, of the council and, and to some extent the, the, the Indian demands to coaching that the Indians had gotten from what were called in those days squaw men, who were actually generally white men who had married into the Indian, uh, married Indian women, or the mixed bloods, although they used a more derogatory term, half-breeds. And uh, the, their, their point, uh, the, the paper's point was that, well, the Indians really didn't know what they were asking for. It must have been due to the coaching they got from these, these white men and these mixed bloods that were living with them that made them ask so high a price. This is an interesting photo because although it was taken in 1876, it talks about making the treaty where the Black Hills were secured or something, but this was actually taken 1876, the next year. There's a little more of that story I'm going to tell you. But here are some examples of these, these men who lived, married into and lived with the Indians. This is uh, Jose Merivale, who's a, a Mexican who had uh, moved in with, uh, with the Red Cloud people. This gentleman is Leon Pallardy, who is a, a Missourian of French extraction who had been involved in the fur trade. He also uh, was living here at the agencies. And these men, because of their ties to the tribes, uh, were very often used as interpreters and guides for delegations going to Washington. This is, this is one of those kinds of meetings. The young man in the center is very interesting. His name is Billy Garnett, William Garnett. His father was uh, Richard Garnett, who was a military officer at Fort Laramie before the Civil War in the U.S. Army, who had fathered young Billy by an Indian woman. And I've often wondered if Billy Garnett ever found out that his father, Richard, was killed as a, a brigade commander at Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863, because Garnett left the U.S. Army, joined the Confederacy, and was one of the major Confederate generals who was killed during Pickett's Charge. But here's his, his son, still out here in Nebraska in 1875, 76, and uh, Billy Garnett plays a role in a lot of these events, uh, the killing of Crazy Horse. He's mentioned, uh, well, I shouldn't say mentioned, he, he gave significant interviews to uh, Judge Ricker of Shadron, who, whose interviews are published in that book John showed you, uh, the Ricker interviews. Billy Garnett talks a lot about this whole period. Fascinating stuff. The newspapers also blamed what they called the Indian Ring for short-circuiting these negotiations. The Indian ring was alleged to be the Indian agents, the, uh, 
the people who supplied the uh, the food contracts, the beef, the flour, all of this, and as well as the uh, the the people that shipped the goods up there, and even people that had little trading establishments at these agencies. The theory was that if the if the Indians got more money for the Black Hills, then these this Indian ring could siphon off more of this money to their own pockets in corruption. So there were a lot of, of people to blame, and, and the, the papers, of course, probably didn't have it right in, this, in every case. They also blamed this commission for the failure of the treaty. Uh, they said, really, the commission had very little experience with a couple, exception of a couple of members of, of dealing with Indians. And they also reported what Red Cloud had to say at the conclusion of the of the negotiations after it was clear that no sale was going to be made. Uh, one of the reporters reported Red, Red Cloud as saying this, it was my intention that the Black Hills should be sustenance for my children as long as they should live. That is what I thought in 1868, and I sit here holding that treaty in my hand. It may be that the white people will think I ask too much, but these Black Hills reach to the skies and are full of wild and tame beasts. I think that the Black Hills are worth more than all of the white people's country. I know well and declare plainly that God placed those hills there for my wealth. You are going to take them away and make me poor. Therefore, do I ask so much for them. Recent scholars who have studied the, the commission and this whole business of, of treaties and negotiations has suggested that maybe the Allison Commission could have succeeded if they, if they and the government, if they hadn't given up with this one, one, one effort. Uh, just because this first council didn't result in, a, in an agreement doesn't mean that an agreement was impossible because, as I said, many of the, the agency uh, Lakotas were, were at least inclined to, to discuss and possibly sell the Black Hills if the price were right. These, of course, were the same groups, for the most part, who had signed the 1868 treaty and who would have to sign off on the sale of more land under that treaty. In reporting the failure of the negotiations, and the Allison Commission rendered a formal report, they kind of glossed over what looked to be sort of half-hearted efforts to, to make an agreement. They, uh, they damned the government's peace policy, in other words, the policy of trying to help Indians become uh, self-supporting over time with education and so on. They damned that policy as a failure, and they actually blamed these, these non-agency groups like the Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse Indians for the reason that the thing fell through because they refused to come down and talk, and uh, they're out there on the war path. But what this did was it gave the Army a good excuse to keep pushing for something they'd wanted for a long time, which was military control over the Indians, get rid of this so-called peace policy. So um, in 1875, with the pressure to get the Black Hills opened up, the government really didn't have patience to keep trying. So um, they decided to turn this Indian problem over to the Army. And what they did was basically... Um, in December of 1875, issued an ultimatum to all of the all of the Indians, but it applied mostly to the roaming Indians in the north, that they had to come into an Indian agency by January 31st of 1876 or face military action. Of course, this was a very short time frame, particularly in the dead of winter, and I don't even know if some of these groups heard the, heard about it before the, the deadline has expired. But it basically amounted to a declaration of war by the government and then did bring on what's been known as the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 1877. Well, that didn't end the Black Hills uh, negotiations, if you want to call them that. In uh, the fall of 1876, this was after the Custer battle and so on and so forth, another commission went back to the Nebraska agencies and also to the Missouri River agencies, and they didn't make much of a pretense of negotiating. This was the Many Penny Commission. And what they did is they went to the agencies and said, okay, uh, either you sign away the Black Hills or the government's going to cut off 
all your rations because at this point the, the, the rationing part of the Treaty of 1868 had expired and the government was not legally obligated to continue to support the, the, the Indians. So this is often called the sell or starve ultimatum. Well, of course, under those circumstances, many of the leading headmen, Spotted Tail, Red Cloud, others signed this, this new agreement, although by no means did the Many Penny Commission secure three quarters of the signatures of all the Indians who should have signed it to make it legal. And of course, despite Custer's defeat at the Little Bighorn, the army kept after Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, and, and their peoples and finally hounded them into surrender in the spring of 1877. Crazy Horse, uh, whoops, I forgot that one. Crazy Horse surrendered at Camp Robinson in May of 1877, and, and of course in September he was killed when the army was trying to incarcerate him in the guardhouse, which is on the left. He died that night in the adjutant's office. So that pretty much put the finale on the, the last uh, episode of the 1876-77 Sioux War. Quickly, I want to just refer to a book that was written in 1991 by uh, Edward Lazarus entitled Black Hills White Justice. He reported on subsequent Sioux efforts to, to gain compensation for, for the Black Hills. It turns out in the early 20th century there were still some elderly survivors of the Red Cloud Spotted Tail generation who finally decided to try to get some compensation for the forced taking of the Black Hills in violation of the 68 Treaty. In 1920, Congress authorized a court of claims to consider Indian claims against the United States. So in 1923, an attorney by the name of Ralph Case filed the Black Hills claim on behalf of the Lakotas. It dragged, uh, the litigation on this case dragged on for decades and decades, and finally in 1974, the Indian Claims Commission finally ruled that the Lakotas were entitled to monetary compensation for the loss of the Black Hills. This then went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the award, and it was then a final a done deal in terms of compensation being due to the to the Lakotas. I I've, I've, was struck by the the comparison between what were seen as preposterous demands of the of the Indians in 1875, a price for the Black Hills. They had wanted seven million dollars plus continued government subsistence. The final judgment in the Black Hills case valued the Black Hills at $17.5 million in 1875 dollars. So that's 10 million more than the Indians were asking in the first place for it in 1875. And of course they wanted continued government support and they still have continued government support so we haven't really uh, uh, managed to, to avoid that in any case so they might as well have just done it to start with. Overall the the Black Hills Award in 1980, by the time interest had been added, was, was $106 million, and it's estimated today to be about a billion dollars, somewhere in that neighborhood. But because of the Indian militancy that grew up in the 1870s, they have refused to touch this money, so it still sits in the U.S. Treasury. And in those, in those contexts, they, they say if we take the money, there'll never be a chance of getting the land back. Interestingly enough, as I drove down here yesterday, I had the Alliance radio station on and I heard something that was brand new to me and that was a report that some of the individual members of the Lakotas tribal groups are now thinking about or maybe have filed a class action suit that would finally accept this seeking to get this money or, or force the tribal, the tribal uh, governments to actually request this money. However, uh, Knowing the politics of, uh, of reservation life, there'll be uh, many, many discussions about this. And the, the report went on to say that this idea was going to be discussed by the tribal, go tribal governments and the tribal religious leaders. So it's entirely possible that more will come out here fairly soon on the, the Black Hills matter that really started, well, it started well before the 1868 treaty, but 1868, 1875 and 76 were the, were the front page news years. So in conclusion, if you go today to Fort Robinson, and I think all of you should if you haven't, uh, you'll get to visit the old fort, 
and the site of the Red Cloud Agency, which figured very prominently in, in this, this story. And if you drive east of Crawford a couple of miles on Highway 20, you'll see a sign that directs you north on a county road, a mile or so north, good county road. If you go there, then you'll come to Old Highway 20, which is now a county road itself. And if you drive a little ways down there, you'll find a big granite marker that the Dawes County Historical Society has erected, which is approximately where this great grand council took place. The lone cottonwood tree is long gone. There are still a few trees in the area. But the, the most impressive thing is you can stand there. You're looking south. You can see this vast plain that still is there to this day. And in the, in, in the distance is Crow Butte looming over the site just like it did in 1875. So it's an interesting story. I hope I've done it justice. And uh, it's an ongoing story. So keep tuned and we'll see what the final fate of this, this story is. I'd be glad to try to answer a question or two if you have them. Thank you very much. OK, I don't see any questions. Oh, I do see one. The Red Cloud Agency, the first one, where, what, near what town is that now? The question was, Red Cloud Agency, where is it located? And actually, it's just the site is just between the town of Crawford and Fort Robinson. Oh, the earlier one. I'm sorry, the earlier the earlier Red Cloud Agency was down on the North Platte River, east of Fort Laramie and west of the Nebraska Wyoming border, uh, a ways. I can't tell you exactly, but it it was down there. These agencies moved around a lot, and so Red Cloud's agency was down there first. The second site was up here on the White River. The third site, if you want to call it, his agency is today's Pine Ridge Reservation. Spotted Tail's agency actually moved even more times. There were at least three sites around Chadron, different sites, including the final one, which is what we call Spotted Tail Agency today, north of Hay Springs. Is it uh, true that the uh, Pine Ridge uh, community, uh, the county where they are in, uh, in South Dakota, remains the poorest? per capita income as a result of uh, possibly this tree? The question was, is it true that the county in which the Pine Ridge Agency, Pine Ridge Reservation, well, I guess Pine, the town of Pine Ridge is located as the poorest per capita in the country? And I've heard that same thing. I don't know if that's absolutely true. There are several. There's about three counties that comprise the, the modern-day Pine Ridge Reservation. All you have to do is drive through there, and you'll see that it's certainly not a prosperous area. But I, I don't honestly know if I keep hearing that there's some place in Mississippi that's the worst. But it may be the whole state. I don't know. But if you're up in that country, there's some neat things to see. Uh, the, the Red Cloud Indian School just north of the Pine Ridge, the town of Pine Ridge, has a nice art gallery. And Red Cloud is buried in the cemetery there. Of course, Spotted Tail's people, the Brulees, their reservation is the Rosebud, which is north of Valentine. So that's a distinct reservation block. But um, many of the, well, I, I should say this uh, bolo I'm wearing today was made by some descendant of these people. This came from the, from the Red Cloud uh, Art Center up in, in uh, Pine Ridge. And it's made by a member of the Oglala Sioux tribe. It's, uh, traditional type beadwork, so. Jim? Yes, sir. I was, uh, I was struck by the, the Indian photos and the possible staging of them, so that the photo, the early photo you had uh, taken at the guy's shop in Omaha, the Indians are dressed in, in Western coats, mm -hmm. and in this later 1876 photo, the Indians are all dressed in their beaded wear and, and headwear and so forth. Now, uh, and not the, uh, the the silver beaver hats that uh, that they held in the earlier photo. Um, do you know what's going on with that kind of staging? Well, I have some some thoughts. The question was, why are sometimes the Indians dressed in white people's clothes, and why are sometimes, and they seem like they're kind of doing the same thing. They're meeting some kind of some kind of a delegation. I think in general, it depended on whether they wanted to seem like Indians or white men. And of course, when they went to Washington to see the Great Father, as I don't know if they ever, ever called the president the Great Father, but it's, they, they would probably dress in, in white 
you see pictures of Red Cloud dressed in a nice frock coat and the top hat and all this stuff. But I think when they wanted to emphasize their you know, native ways, and if they were going out to speak to a crowd in New York City, they'd probably be wearing their, their traditional dress. So I don't know in this case, these two cases, uh, I think the case where the photo was taken in Omaha, they were on their way to Washington, undoubtedly. And this other gathering, I don't know where that larger group photo was taken. But you see, you see these variations all the time. And I think Indians, like everybody else, they, they figured out what's going to make the best impression for the audience we're dealing with. And so that's the best I can do. The suit has been settled. Basically, as I said, in, in 1974, the Indian Claims Commission granted them an award that I think at that time was based on, it, it was about $106 million, taking into account inflation and all of that. They haven't taken, the, 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 the Lakotas have not taken that money. It's still sitting in the U.S. Treasury, so over the time it's accumulated interest. And the last figure I read was it might be something in the neighborhood of a billion dollars now. But until they formally accept this compensation, it's just going to sit there and draw interest. And they haven't accepted it yet, although there seem to be signs that at least some of the members think they ought to because I don't know how realistic it is to think that they'll ever really recapture the land. If you've been in the Black Hills lately, I don't suppose that seems very realistic. But Yeah, well, wall drug, I don't know if that would be included or not. That's on the east edge. They could probably have that, and some people wouldn't care. <laughs> well, if nothing else, thank you very Oh, Troy. Is, is, is that land actually defined? I mean, how they would get that money for Is there an actual line on a map that they have in that? There is a, there is a, a, a definition by land, latitude and longitude that, that was in this 1876 so-called agreement that the Indians signed off on, although not very many of them, but the, where the government literally took the Black Hills, that prescribes what territory the United States is taking. So I think that's probably the basis for determining what land is included in this compensation. And I don't know what that is, but it's in the document. If you wanted to look at the document, it would tell you from such and such a point on the Missouri River to the such and such um, uh, degree of latitude. It's all in that no, kind of term. I think it basically went from the east side of the Black Hills over to the what would be the Wyoming border, roughly speaking. Anyway, it's an interesting story and, and one that I think, while we maybe necessarily shouldn't be proud that it happened in Nebraska, it's, it's certainly an important story that happened in Nebraska. And I just say one more thing. I've collected all of these newspaper letters and am presently in, in the thinking mode about how to get them into print. They're really fascinating. I don't know if they're over too much for the average person, but they're, they're great stories of what was going on, admittedly from the white man's point of view, but nonetheless, I think they deserve to be more accessible. And the only way you can do it now is just plow through the newspapers, and it's pretty hard to do. Thank you again. <laughs>